Well, welcome to Boxy Community Church. My name is Pastor Rick Thomas, and this is Sunday, May the 23rd, 2021. We are continuing our study in Hebrews, Christ is Better, and we will be settling on verses 11 to 13. If you have your Bibles open, please follow along as I read. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, you might want to ask yourself, this seems out of place in light of what we have been talking about in Hebrews chapter 3 and the first part of chapter 4. The apostle has been reminding us about the children of Israel from history past, that they did not enter the rest that God promised to them. You remember last week we spent a lot of time on this. God promised rest to Israel. Rest in the sense that they would go into this land, that God would take care of all of the ites in the land, that God promised them that they would occupy homes that they didn't build, they would have vineyards they didn't plant, and that there would be peace because God would fight for them. God would protect them. God would go before them. But it says several times in chapter 3 and chapter 4, they didn't enter their rest. And we are also told why. Because they were disobedient. Because they had an evil, unbelieving heart. Chapter 3, verse 12. Because they did not unite what they heard with faith. That they were disobedient. We learned from last week that when we have these elements in our heart, and a Christian can have an evil, unbelieving heart, a Christian can doubt God, a Christian can disobey God, a Christian can hear the word of God and not act on it, which means they put their faith into practice, they don't have rest. They don't have rest. They're in turmoil. They are not at peace. And so what the apostle does here in these three verses, and you've often heard them explained about the nature and the character of the word of God, which is absolutely true. You can take this, this verse 12 out of its immediate context and establish a theology about the nature and the power and the purpose of the word of God. And you would not do injustice to the verse, but the verse lives in a context. And the context is, I'm talking about my beloved brethren in the past. They didn't have rest. They didn't have peace. They had the prophets. In fact, we studied last week that they had good news preached to them, just like we have good news preached to us today. And now he comes along and says, look, enough is enough for once and for all. We are going to establish establish that when God says in his word, I will give you rest, you can have the rest if you obey what he says. Now, I've read that to you in the New American Standard. Permit me to read it to you in two other versions, okay? The Amplified Bible says this. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, meaning making it operative, energizing it, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nation, uh, nature, 
exposing and ju judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Message Bible says this, God means what he says. What he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one can resist the, God, the word of God. We can't get away from it, no matter what. So as we approach it from this perspective, that the apostle is saying, look, you've had the prophets, they've preached to you good news, and yet you rejected one final shot here for you, and it's the word of God. I want to show you this visual, and I want you to tell me what you see. What's this guy doing? What's the instrument he's using? What about this guy? What's he doing? One is a telescope, right? The other one is a microscope, right? What does the telescope do? Looks far out into the sky. The larger, bigger picture, right? What does the microscope do? Brings everything down to focus down to the minutest detail underneath a powerful magnifying glass. Beloved, that's the word of God. The word of God is so vast, it entails the entire universe and all that is involved with it. And yet it is not so ethereal that it cannot be brought down to where you are living today in whatever problem you are facing today. Aren't you glad of that, that God does not speak in such lofty concepts that you look at yourself as a microcosm and say, and certainly, I cannot apply that because I cannot understand it. I cannot grasp it. Then the apostle says, oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Now, notice in verse 12, for the word of God. The Greek word here is logos. Let me give you a picture, okay? The word of God. First of all, this broad concept, logos, okay? It means the very concepts of God. It's the expression of thoughts of God. That's the word here. Okay, what have we seen in the past about the expression of the thoughts of God? You had the Old Testament, right? The prophets, the priests. In fact, if you remember two weeks ago, I think I had a slide presentation up here, that the Old Testament was canonized that means all of the books were form, uh, form, formulated or put together around 200 B.C., 200 years before Christ was born. So when he says the word of God, they would understand the Old Testament, but they would understand it refers to Jesus. Because in John chapter 1, verse 1, what is the same? And the word was with God and the word was God. Who is John 1 talking about? It's talking about Jesus. So when you take a look at this word logos, logos, the word of God can apply to the Old Testament and it can uh, uh, apply to Jesus himself. So watch this. You have the written word and you have the living word. So what is the description of this? But before we go on, let me show you this word, rhema. Rhema, that's another Greek word for the Bible. But it is a specific word, meaning an exact word from God. When Jesus faced the temptation in Matthew chapter 4, it said, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. You know what he was re referring to? Not loga, logos, rhema. In fact, your spiritual equipment, Ephesians chapter 6, and I hope you put it on on a regular basis, is not every day. One of it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema, the word of God. Now, beloved, here you are facing a temptation in your life. You're down at Connie's. You gave her a ten. You gave the cashier a ten dollar bill, and she gave you change back for twenty. 
Whoa. What do you do? Well, it's her mistake. You pocket the money. You see, you would not use some vague concept of the word of God to handle that temptation. You would use the specific word of God for that temptation. One of the ways to get the enemy to flee from you, listen to me, one of the ways to get the enemy to flee from you is to use the word of God, the specific word of God. You just don't say, pray about it, and he'll go away. I'm sorry. That comment that was made, what was it, under the Reagan administration, I think it was, just say no to drugs? I'm sorry, that didn't work very well, did it? Just say no to Satan. Satan, he'll take your nose all day long. That will not affect him. You know what will affect him? The exact word of God. That's why. It says so often in the Bible, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the demons had to flee, and Satan had to leave them alone. All right, let's get into this this morning, okay? Notice the character of the Word of God, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is the description of the Word of God. Now, permit me to give you some Greek explanation on these words to try to bring it alive for us, okay? The idea of living means the gift of God. The gift of God. God gives life. What he said, what he says, brings things to life. It brings his word to fulfillment. Have you ever thought about the many times where it said, God said? God said? May I just give you a couple of examples? Genesis 9 12, God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Have you ever seen a double rainbow? Any of you ever seen a double rainbow? When we first got down to Montana, uh, when we were out there for about a year and a half or two years, we saw a double rainbow when he first got down there. That is God keeping his promise. That is living. That rainbow says, I am alive and I will not punish the earth like I did before with a universal flood. What about Genesis 17, 9? But God said, no, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall call him Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants with him. Did God fulfill that promise? Yeah, it's called the Jews, right? He fulfilled his promise. Oh, by the way, Abraham, how old are you? Well, I've been collecting Social Security for about 35 years. He's 100 and Sarah's 75, or is it the other way around? I think that's the right way. And God made that promise to him. God's word is living. What he says will come true. How about Exodus 3.14? And the Lord and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. What was? Why did that make sense? That's so important to the nation of Israel in captivity because that was a covenantal name given to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And God is saying, I'm still alive. I'm still going to keep my word that I told to you. And you just tell them, I am has sent me. Exodus 16.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. Did God do that? He most certainly did. Ten plagues, right? His word came true. He delivered his people at the right time. Exodus 17, 6. Behold, I'm not going through all the Bible. Exodus 17, 6. I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. After all of those miracles, the first little problem that comes into the life, they start complaining and murmuring. We have nothing to drink. And what did God tell Moses? Strike the rock. 
That's all you got to do, strike the rock. My word is living. Just do what I said. Strike the rock. And water came out. In fact, Moses had a previous experience of this when he held out the rod, the staff that God gave to him, over the Red Sea, and it parted. About Numbers 20. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it shall yield its water. So, they, uh, uh, so you shall bring water for them out of the rock and have the congregation, the live drop, Lifestyle drink. Well, guess what? He didn't speak to it. He struck the rock. God still gave water in spite of Moses' disobedience. And unfortunately, Moses never entered the land. He saw it, but he never entered. The Lord spoke to David and Job and Samuel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and the minor prophets. What the Lord spoke came to pass. His word was fulfilled. Those prophecies unfulfilled, listen to me, will be fulfilled for the prophecies are yet future. Since God has proven himself trustworthy and reliable, we should not, we must not doubt what he says. The Lord told the children of Israel as they were about to go into the promised land and they head across the Jordan River. What did he tell Moses? What did he tell the priesthood? You have the priest go out front first. Usually they were in the middle of the group. You have them go out there first. And the minute, and they hated water, you know that. And the minute their soul touched the water, the minute their feet touched the water, what happened to the Jordan River? Tell me, what happened to the Jordan River? It parted. Why? Because God said so. God's word is living, beloved. These Jews were about to go back to an orthodox, dead religion of Judaism that did not give life. All it gave was condemnation. You know why Judaism only gave condemnation? Because by the time we get to the New Testament and Jesus' day, how many commandments were there? There were not 10 commandments, beloved. 613. 613. Can you imagine trying to live one hour in trying to keep all 613 commandments? Utter failure, right? Wouldn't be able to do it. And it was a burden to all of the people except the Pharisees. They always found a way to excuse what they were doing. God's word is living, beloved. You read something in this word, it should quicken your soul. It should charge you up. It should resuscitate your spirit. It should jack you up. You should get excited when you read God's word. And that's the spot for an amen. I can't hear you. And then it's active. The Greek word for active means effective. It means productive due to a result. God's word is active. It produces a result. It has an effectual working it is not dry and boring and lifeless and irrelevant. You talk to people and talk to them about the Word of God, and sometimes they'll tell you that, won't they? Well, that was for them back then. It doesn't apply today. It doesn't apply to my situation. That telegraphs to you right away what their concept is about the Word of God. They don't understand. It is active. See, beloved, if you believe that God's word breathes life into your situation that you're fe uh, uh, facing, and if you believe that as he breathes life through his word into that situation, there will be a productive result, you will participate with it. You will get on board. 
you will work in cooperation with what the Word of God has to say. That activeness of the Word of God should dispel our fear and our worry and our anxiety and our disbelief. Notice it also says it's sharper. The idea means to cut. Listen, it's a comprehensive, decisive stroke. Comprehensive, uh, dis um, yeah, Thomas, decisive stroke. Aren't you glad that when you go see a surgeon, like I did when I had my quadruple so many years ago, that he didn't tell my wife, well, I don't know quite what's wrong. Uh, we'll, we'll get the chest separator and just cut them open and take a look inside and see what's wrong. If I was conscious, I would probably say, no! What do you think you're doing? But they took the proper tests and the x-rays and so forth and so on, and they realized I had four that needed to be replaced. Exact, decisive application. That's what this word sharper means. The word of God, listen to me, is able, the word of God is able to pierce, to cut through exactly what needs to be done. Now, what is that? Well, take a look at the next slide. Soul and spirit. Is that what it says there in verse 12? And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Now, I want you to see a pattern here, okay? We're going from the outside to the inside. Personality to the spirit, that which lives on eternally to the inside. Piercing. And then joints and marrow outside to the inside. The marrow is within the joints. That's what helps your joints kind of move, move around a little bit, okay? And division. And then thoughts and intentions of the heart. Outside to inside. Judging. The Greek word is krino. It means to separate. Many times in your confusion, listen to me, many times in your confusion, you cannot separate your thoughts from your intentions, because they are so intertwined. Now listen to me. They're intertwined because of your emotional response to your circumstances. But the Word of God can help separate that so you know what you should do in cooperation with what the Word has to say. And when you cooperate with the Word, what with the Word, mm -hmm, when you cooperate with what the Word has to say, you're going to glorify God. And you are going to reap the blessing of obedience. Let me say that again. You're going to glorify God. And you're going to reap the blessing of obedience to God. Look at the power of God's word. You got rest? The apostle says, once and for all. I'm, I'm going to tell you, once and for all. That the word of God will do what it says. It is living. It is active. It is powerful. And I also want you to see something here. That the word of God does not work on the outside of man to conform. But works on the inside of man to transform. I struggled when I put this statement together. But I am absolutely comfortable and confident in this statement. May I explain why? Here's why. Because if the Word of God only conforms you on the outside, given the right circumstances, what you will do is you'll go back to your old way of life. You've seen it in your own life, probably. You've seen it in the lives of people that you love, haven't you? They get jammed up. They're in a crisis. Here come the tears. Here comes the, oh, please help me. I know I've done you wrong. And 
all of the emotional responses, and you take that as genuine repentance. You might even bail them out if it's a financial situation. And they're okay for a while, but then what happens? The discipline of God's word to change becomes uncomfortable for them. And like these Jews who want to go back, they do. They go back to their former way of life. Beloved, that's why there are AA groups and GA groups and all the other type of groups. It's a revolving door because only they deal with the confirmation or the conformity of the outside and never the transformation on the inside. Rick, how can you say that? You take a look at their 12 steps. What is their God? Their God is whatever you determine to be your power. It could be a lamppost. It could be a statue in your backyard. It could be a picture. Whatever you determine to be your God. And in all the 12 steps, the only thing it comes close to, and I'm not kicking the 12 steps. I'm trying to illustrate to you. The only thing that comes close to repentance is you need to make things right for the people that you've hurt. I don't see that in the Bible. The Bible says, repent. The Bible says, go one-on-one -on -one and make sure things are taken care of. Do they have their spot? Yes, they do, but understand it's temporary. You go into a meeting, there's a format. You have a group of men or women sitting in a circle. You have a facilitator. He's not a counselor. She's not a counselor. She's a facilitator. And what you have to do to start off the group, everybody has to introduce themselves. Okay? And how do they introduce themselves? Hi, my name is Rick. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hi, my name is Rick. I'm a recovering sexual addict. Hi, my name is Rick. I'm a recovering gambler. Hi, my name is Rick, and I eat too much macaroni and cheese. I probably should find a group like that. You understand? I'm identifying with my sin that I supposedly have repented of. What do you call yourself, guys? Is that what you call yourself? When you go to God in prayer, God, this is Rick. I am, I, I am a recovering whatever. And God will look at me and shake his head. Because that's not how God describes me. Does he? How does the word of God describe me? I'm saved, I am chosen, I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I have a spiritual gift, I have a purpose. I am elect. All of these marvelous positional words that God has incorporated into his word to describe me. How dare I insult God by coming to him saying, I'm Rick, a recovering alcoholic. I'm focusing in on the wrong thing, amen? I'm focusing in on the wrong thing. If I simply conform to the outside, if that's all the Word of God does, conform me to the outside, watch out, the shoe's going to drop. But the Word of God is designed to change me from the inside out. Transformation. Transformation. All you have to do is take a look at the interactions that Jesus has when he was on earth. And the people who he came in contact with, and their lives were changed from the inside out. How do I know that? Because they stopped doing what they were doing before they met Jesus. That's why. Matthew, tax collector, right? He was an embezzler. He cheated at his very own people. And he met Jesus. Zacchaeus, chief tax collector, he did the same thing up in a tree, remember? And he saw Jesus gets converted, brings him to his house. 
What does it say? Since I have robbed people, I will give tenfold, fourfold. He made restitution. Why? Because he was chained from the inside out. How can we continue in sin if God has truly redeemed us through his son? Now, I'm not saying, Christian, you won't struggle with sin, but I find it difficult, and so does God, that you persist to live in unrepentant sin. You can't justify it, according to the word of God. Now, the next verse tells us you can't pretend with God. And I wondered about this verse, but look at how it starts off. And. So it's a connector. And there is no creature, anything that God has created. God has created everything, right? There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We cannot pretend with God. But the Old Testament Jews did. They pretended every time they came in with a sacrifice. They were simply fulfilling a religious obligation. Later on in Hebrews 10, it will tell us that all the blood of bulls and goats did not take away sin. It only covered up the sin. Look, you can come to church. You can sing. You can clap your hands. You can dance. You can say hallelujah. You can, you know, praise the Lord, whatever. You can walk out of here and be unchanged. You, you might deceive us. But you won't deceive God. You cannot pretend. You cannot hide from him. Nothing is hidden from him. Everything is open and laid bare. Now, these two Greek words have a very interesting combination. The idea of being laid open is that you are naked. You are naked before God. Spiritually naked before God. Can you imagine that? I don't think we think along those terms sometimes, do we? We are naked, stripped down spiritually before God. There is no clothing that we can wear to hide his piercing eye. And the idea of laid bare, this I find this interesting, it means to be grabbed by the throat and lifted up and look eye to eye. Wow. That's the word picture here. So the Spirit of God uses the Word of God, which is living and active and powerful than any two-edged sword. We cannot hide from God. And the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and strip us down naked before Him spiritually, grab us by the throat figuratively, raise us up And we are looking smack dab into the eyes of our Redeemer. It's like somebody caught in a physical sin. And they are brought eye to eye, face to face with this person that they've sinned against. That's the idea here. That's the idea. Now, I did a little bit more research, and I would like to share it with you. I want to read you some verses about God knowing us. God knowing us. That's what this verse is saying. God knows us. You can't hide from God. He knows us. Well, how much does he know? He knows everything. Luke 20, 23, but he detected their trickery and said to them, Matthew 22, 18, but Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? John 2, 25, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning him, for he himself knew what was in man. John 4, 29, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Is this not the Christ? Referring to the Samaritan woman. He had never met the woman before, but he identified. Five times you've been married, and the guy that you're living with now, you're just shacking up. He knew. 
John 5, 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get made, made well? He never saw this man before. Man by the pool of Bethsaida, 38 years. He knew. John 6, 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. John 6, 61. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? In John 16, 19, Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while, and you will not see me again, and a little while more, you, uh, and, and again a little while, you will not see me? Jesus knew. Jesus knows us. And that's why it's so encouraging, beloved. This is not a message of, of, of condemnation. It's a message to encourage you that if he knows us that well, why do you hide? Why do I hide from coming into the presence of God with the sorrows and the burdens and the joys and the hurts that I have in my life? Because he has promised to give me rest. Why do we do that? Because we have an evil, unbelieving heart. Because we don't really believe what he has to say. And that's why the apostle says one more time, the word of God, all the scriptures that you Jews have from the Old Testament and the very fact that Jesus dwelt among you for three years, ministering powerful, the word of God, you've got it all. What more do you want? The rest that we so often long for, that so often eludes us, is only found in the word of God. One of the ways that you lose rest, beloved, is you get careless with your time with God. You get careless. You don't think it's very important. It's okay to skip a day that turns into days that turn into weeks, and the only time you're in the Word of God when you come into this building. In a marital situation, that would be called neglect. That a husband is working all the time, only comes home to have dinner, and maybe to have sex, but that's it. There's no communication. There's no sharing of a dream. There's no conversation about anything. There's no resolution to a, a problem. He is using the relationship. Please don't use God. He used himself up for you at the cross. He's got nothing more to give because he's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You can trust God's word. Because it gives life. It produces results. It is precise and accurate. And it changes me from the inside out. And that's what the apostle is trying to tell his beloved brethren. That as he put it in Romans chapter 10, if I could anathemize myself, if I could go to hell on behalf of my Jewish brethren, that they would be saved. He said, I would be more than willing to do that, but I can't. They have got to make the decision. Now listen to me, each and every one of you this morning, you need to make the decision to believe God's word and embrace his rest. You have to make that decision. No one else can make it for you. And whether someone joins you in enjoying the rest is not the issue. You can be at perfect rest with God and be alone with all of the waves crashing in 
upon you. Just think of Jesus in the boat, sleeping sound as a baby in a cradle. And the disciples were about to get swamped. In fact, they run down there. Jesus, wake up. Don't you care? We're about to perish. I would love to have a Kodak picture of that moment when he opened his eyes and looked at them. I think he probably had this look on his face like, you boneheads, I'm right here. So he gets up and what? Calms the storm. Jesus is right there with you in the midst. But you've got to go to him. You've got to enter his rest. It's our choice. And I'll be honest with you. And I say this not looking for pity. Do not come up and hold my hand and say, there, 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 I'll slap you. I'm teasing. Maybe. <laughs> June's going to be a hard month for me. Our wedding anniversary. The home going of my bride. I know it's going to be a hard month. But I have to believe the very thing that I'm trying to tell you. I've got to shun an evil, unbelieving heart. I've got to unite faith to the promises of God's rest. I have to be obedient to the promises of God's rest. And so do you. I've written this closing prayer. Lord, I... Lord, I come to you bone tired. I'm weary and overwhelmed. I feel like I've got the weight of the world on my back. You tell me you give me rest. In fact, you promised to give me rest in Matthew chapter 11. But I'm struggling with unbelief. I wonder if you can really change this situation I am facing, it seems so impossible. I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with disobedience, I'm wanting to either run away or ignore the problem or to run ahead of you and take charge. I know both are not of you or from you, but I'm at my wit's end. I know that if I am going to successfully face this problem, I need to come to you. Lord, I'm coming to you. I know that you are the only person who can bring a resolution to my situation. Please strengthen me to take your yoke to come underneath your authority instead of mine. Sometimes when I think of what you might tell me to do, I get petrified. I need to learn more about you and your ways. The path I am traveling does not seem to have any direction or purpose. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I need to believe your yoke is light and easy. I need to learn your ways, act upon them, and enter the promised rest you promised to give me. Help me, Lord Jesus, as I wait patiently and eagerly for you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the reminder about the power of your word. Thank you that 
We need to trust it every moment of every day in every situation that we're confronted with. Thank you that it brings life. Thank you that it is so precise like a surgeon's scalpel. It will cut down exactly to where we need to hear and couple our faith with what we believe. Thank you for the awesome warning. We cannot hide from you. You know us inside and out. You know us completely. In fact, you are a great sympathetic high priest who is touched with our infirmities. And so, Father, this morning as we close, I pray that you would seal your word to our hearts. And what I mean by that is that you would engraft them. You would plow up the hard soil. You would uh, put fur furrows in that will receive the seed and bring forth fruit as a testimony to your glory and to our obedience and as examples to others who might be watching us in the situations that we are facing. To God be the glory. Great things. Great things he has done and great things he will do. I thank you for being my savior, Jesus. I thank you, Spirit of God, to continue to live in this struggle between the old man and the new nature. You don't give up. And I thank you, God the Father, that you selected me from the foundations of the world to be your child. We love you. We just stand in awe of who you are and who you want to be to each and every person this morning. I pray this in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Be blessed.